Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Canadian International Council's Canada Speaks Multilateralism and Flux. We are very happy to have you here, and we're very excited to have um, wonderful speakers with us. My name is Caroline Dunton. Um, I'm the president of the CIC's Hamilton branch, serving Hamilton, Halton, and Niagara, and hosting today's event, um, which is for everyone coming to us from across Canada. I'm also a PhD candidate in international relations at the University of Ottawa. The CIC is a nonpartisan organization whose goal is to advance constructive conversation in many ways about global politics for Canadians across the country. It operates 19 branches, so if you are joining us from elsewhere in Canada, there is likely a branch near you. Please check out the CIC.org to learn more. Today's event will be hosted by my colleague, Rory Nissan, who is our branch's past president and currently a city councillor in Burlington, Ontario. Um, and he will be moderating, moderating the discussion and will introduce our speakers momentarily. Before passing it over to Rory, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the CIC Hamilton branch resides is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement and is directly adjacent to the Haldeman Territory. The wampum um, uses the symbolism of a dish uh, to represent the territory and the spoon to represent that the people are to share the resources of the land and only take what they need. As a scholar of global politics, I challenge you to think um, about the concepts and ideas um, in the international as they apply to questions of settler colonialism at home. The domestic and the international are not discrete um, and separate categories. When we talk about sovereignty, territory, land, occupation, they're not only things that exist between modern nation states, they are foundational to what constitutes Canada as well. As we look towards a world with increased democracy, cooperation, and power in the hands of everyday people in civil society, I hope that you can reflect on what that looks like, where Indigenous sovereignty, land stewardship, and authority are respected, and there's coexistence for lands, peoples, and the natural world. Uh, so I will hand it over to Rory. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Much appreciated. <clears throat> so um, I'll begin with an introduction of our uh, panelists today. And I'm going to make a very brief introductions, but Caroline will be putting uh, the web links to their bios into the chat. So we have uh, David Malone, uh, Rector of the United Nations University and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. And <clears throat> excuse me, I could uh, give you David's full bio, but it would take the full hour. So I will cut that short, uh, but uh, you can learn more about him at the link. And then we have uh, Rujin Habibi here with us as well. Rujin is an international lawyer and doctoral researcher uh, working at the intersection of international law, global health and human rights. So you can learn more about uh, Rujin at the link uh, to her bio as well. So I'll make very brief uh, introductory remarks. Um, we uh, are here today to um, explore what Canadians expect and require from multilateral institutions to address their core interests in their lives and their communities. Uh, the Canadian International Council, <clears throat> we see ourselves as a voice of everyday Canadians in foreign policy. We recently uh, completed a deliberative democracy exercise called Foreign Policy by Canadians. Uh, this was a first of its kind Canada project. Uh, it engaged 444 Canadians, a representative of the country. Um, and it uh, was determining where Canadians stand on various foreign policy issues. And, uh, you know, one leg of the project was a review of the multilateral system uh, focused on the WHO. And we are here to discuss multilateralism in general, but uh, also in the wake of the pandemic, uh, and the mixed views Canadians demonstrated towards the WHO in foreign policy by Canadians. So we'll hear more about that, uh, the WHO specifically from uh, Rougine in just a few minutes. Um, now, just a you know, point of order here, please use the uh, Q&A um, to ask your uh, questions. And uh, we'll be watching the Q&A um, uh, very closely. And this really is about you. We're calling this Canada Speaks for a reason. We want to hear your questions and comments. And I'll be reflecting as many of those as possible over the next hour. 
So we'll be here till 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So uh, with that, I'm going to begin uh, with uh, Dr. Malone, although I'll call him uh, David today. Uh, David, um, I want to start with the hot topic on the table right away. So the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly, um, does their reaction to the invasion of Ukraine reflect a weakened UN or one that is acting as intended? Does the UN have a role to play when a veto holding great power is behaving maliciously uh, and against the UN Charter? So that would be our first question. Great, well, uh, the UN Charter, uh... Uh, now uh, over 70 years old, well over 70 years old, has proved, proven quite resilient in the sense that there are checks and balances. The forum in which um, uh, security issues are most discussed, uh, notably the Ukraine recently, uh, is subject to vetoes from five countries. One of those countries is the Russian Federation. It has vetoed any meaningful response to uh, the Ukraine crisis. But then the issue moved to the General Assembly because the General Assembly can discuss peace and security issues if the Security Council is deadlocked or otherwise not acting. And the vote in the General Assembly was a crushing defeat for the Russian Federation. So in that sense, while the Security Council is the most kinetic organ of the UN, it isn't the only one able to deal with security crises. Entirely uh, agree, David. Thank you very much uh, for that. So what is your expectation uh, going forward from the UN, the outcomes from the uh, UN General Assembly resolution? Will that do you, expect, um, do you expect it to in any way change the outcome of what's going on uh, in Ukraine at this time? I think the most useful role of the UN is to provide a platform for all sorts of exchanges of information, views. It's not the only such platform, but it's the most universal such platform. So for example, we know from the vote in the General Assembly that while overall it was a crushing defeat for the Russian Federation, there were two continents which are of mixed minds over the matter. One is Africa, because Africa is hugely dependent on donors, but it's also dependent on both China and to a lesser extent the Russian Federation. And so um, half uh, of the African countries abstain. Uh, and in Asia, Asian countries prefer not to take sides if they can avoid it. So uh, Japan, for example, where normally I live, I'm in New York right now, um, Japan uh, voted to uh, condemn the invasion of Ukraine, but a number of countries preferred to abstain, in part because they felt they didn't understand the issue well enough, but in part because they'd rather not take sides uh, in a dispute. Thank you, David. And I think we'll talk uh, with uh, Rujin as well about some of the consequences of that um, resolution, for example, on, uh, on Bangladesh and its vote. Uh, so we'll get to that uh, just in a moment. One more question, David, before we move to Rujin. So, of course, um, NATO uh, and the UN are two very different uh, institutions, one uh, being, as you said, the uh, number one forum for international uh, relations, but the other being a uh, military alliance uh, with teeth. Um, so when you see from where you are, uh, NATO acting with great uh, unity on uh, Ukraine, which of course is not an alliance member, does that give you more faith in the multilateral system or does it concern you that this action is once again uh, taking place outside of the Security Council? No, I think it's uh, NATO is an alliance. Uh, 
of countries, it isn't the same as the UN at all. I think they each play an important role, NATO for its membership, and uh, uh, other countries always take note of what NATO is planning to do. Um, but the UN is a semi-universal platform. So in that, they're very different. Uh, I think if there was a mistake countries like Canada made over the past 30 years, it was that thinking that a conflict might never recur, that somehow with the Cold War having enter, ended, we had entered a period of no global conflicts, perhaps regional conflicts would continue to proliferate, and we turned out to be wrong about that. So reinvesting in NATO is, in my view, a good, view, uh, a good idea for Canada. Uh, but many Canadians will defer. The great thing about Canada is there's lots of disagreement about everything. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well said. And uh, that actually is a great segue to uh, bring Regine into the uh, conversation because uh, Rougine, you were very much involved in the foreign policy by Canadians process, so you saw the disagreements uh, that uh, occurred among uh, your group when they looked at multilateral uh, issues. So um, could you begin by telling us what you saw through that process and what it told you about Canadians' perceptions of the World Health Organization in particular? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Rory. So um, I think Canadians in general, uh, one of the key themes that emerged from the discussions that we were hearing uh, among Can the Canadians were having amongst themselves about the WHO is that they really understood the role of the WHO as a leading authority in matters of global health. And I think the pandemic also reinforced this notion that global health is also a foreign policy issue that very much requires engagement with uh, from diplomats and from from various arms of Canada's uh, foreign policy, uh, um, foreign policy branches. But one of the key things that emerged from the discussions was also that Canadians wanted to see where their money or what was the value for money that they were that they were getting from their government investing in the WHO. Um, and so the, the relationship that they were um, describing was really one that was transactional as opposed to in the past where international organizations really held sort of this idea, idealistic perception in the view of the general public as, as, as just institutions of moral authority and, and institutions that have uh, weight in and uh, or value in and of themselves. Canadians wanted to see what the WHO was bringing out to them. And really this discussion was tinged a bit with the discussion of, uh, with the first year of the pandemic, what they perceived to be failures in the first year of the pandemic uh, of, from the WHO. Um, and again, the key issue around here was what it, what what is uh, what are we getting from funding the WHO? And the the question of funding, I really I think that the, one of the easiest ways to conceptualize this this question of should we be funding the WHO more? It, what does it really do for us? Is a question of which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Um, so what I mean by that is that the, the, the whole world gets out of the WHO what it is willing to put into it. Um, WHO has two, two general overarching types of funding. It has uh, assessed contributions, which are mandatory contributions, and it has voluntary earmarked funding. And WHO at the moment, uh, only 20, just over 20% of its funding comes from mandatory assessed contributions that every country that is a member state of WHO donates or gives to the WHO as part of its membership dues. The other 80% really is earmarked funding. So it's funding that every country individually says, this is what I'm giving you money for. Uh, this is what I want. This, this is the health priority. I want this money to go towards. And that has three consequences for how the WHO can really operate, uh, the, or three hindrances. The first is that we have certain health issues that are chronically underfunded at the WHO. Show. And these are things like non-communicable diseases, but also emergency preparedness. Um, emergencies and health emergencies in general are among those issues where when they're not occurring, uh, we as a general public uh, don't see the value in investing. And when it suddenly is occurring and probably in the immediate aftermath, there is this push to increase funding towards emergency preparedness. But after the after that, that excitement of the aftermath uh, is is we we surpass that really we enter a lull phase where we forget um, 
what was the what was the consequence of lack of preparedness? So that's the first consequence. The second consequence, of course, is um, that WHO is, is perceived as not being independent because of fact because of the fact that it doesn't have predictable, sustainable, and flexible funding. And the third consequence is that it's also subject to politicization. Um, what I mean by that again is that we saw in the middle of the pandemic, um, at the height of the pandemic. Uh, Trump, Donald, the Trump administration essentially um, announcing that it uh, plans to withdraw from the organization. Now, the withdrawal didn't take effect because it would it had submitted its notice, and the notice would have taken effect in a year's time. So, luckily, by then the Biden administration had come in, and so there was no more withdrawal of WHO as a question. But that was at the height of the pandemic when the United States is WHO's largest contributor. Um, so the, the, the really the question around uh, funding the WHO and what we get out of it is really a question of which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Are we willing to put in the money to see WHO operating um, at its optimal performance? Thank you so much. Regine. So um, I, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to show you how naive I or unaware I am. How much are how much do we fund the WHO? Like, what is their total budget? Uh, do you roughly do you do you know that? Yeah, sure. The WHO's total budget. I haven't looked at the figure exactly at the moment, but I know it's just over. I I believe, and and uh, I have to go back and check. It's just over two billion, I believe. Um, okay. And that is roughly the budget of a, uh, a medium-sized research hospital in the U.S. So just sort of to give um, a comparison, that is what the WHO is running on at the moment. Um, and it has a few big contributions from states, from the states like the United States and from Germany, um, and others have remark uh, markedly less a contribution towards WHO. Yeah, I mean, two, $2 billion is a lot for one person, but not so much for global pandemic, uh, universal multilateral response. Now, Based on what you saw from Canadians and foreign policy by Canadians, um, do you think they would be, or were they happy to hear that 80% of funding is earmarked? Do you think that's, that's something that ordinary Canadians, like, is there a natural propensity to say, that's a good thing? Uh, and you've, you've noted all the pitfalls of that. Yeah, so I, I think that when we had this discussion around increasing um, assessed contributions to WHO um, and moving away from earmarked contributions, there was an understanding that we did need that flexibility. We did need to fund an organization sustainably uh, to, to respond to emergencies when they arise. But um, And this is also the discussion that's happening right now with the WHO um, Committee on Sustainable Financing that's looking at this issue at the moment and as we speak, is that whenever we there's an increase in assessed contributions there's also an expectation of greater transparency from the organization more um more more reports on where the money is going and more accountability um and so whether the who has done enough or not is up for debate but i think canadians generally also mimicked what we're seeing right now as uh, discussions that are happening at who's executive board and also our dis discussions that are happening at the world health assembly that uh if, if WHO is to receive more money, mandatory contributions from us and less earmarked funding, we really need to see in a very transparent way and probably in a real time way where that money is going and how it's being accounted for. And to get that level of transparency requires funding as well, though, doesn't it? That doesn't just happen naturally. So the chicken and the egg, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Thank you, Ruji. Well, I'm going to go back to David now, and we have a couple of interesting questions already coming in from the audience, and I would just encourage you to ask your questions, uh, ideally in the Q&A, but I'm watching the chat as well, so either one will work. Um, and so the first uh, question, David, and you, uh, you sort of opened this uh, question about Canadian foreign policy um, and the way that we've been uh, looking at the, the world the last 30 years in terms of conflict and war. So um, that, I think that's brought out some, some interest. And uh, now Canada is a part of many uh, multilateral institutions, probably more than any other country. For example, the Commonwealth, the Francophonie, and then obviously in NATO, the UN, um, there are many more. But um, so that begs the question that we had coming in here, I was trying to get the name from Lou. So Lou was asking about Canada's failure to secure a seat at the Security Council in 2020. 
Uh, he said that that uh, appeared to mark a significant loss of respect and prestige over the last 10 years of both uh, liberal and conservative governments. And I would note that both uh, governing parties have lost an election uh, recently, and it's been now 22 years since Canada sat on the Security Council. What does Canada need to do to rehabilitate its reputation in the UN and in other international institutions? Um, I think Canada doesn't need to do much. Why? Its positive reputation never went away. Uh, Bob Ray is the current Canadian ambassador at the UN in New York. He's hugely influential within the organization. It was a very good appointment. We lost the Security Council campaigns, the last two, as you mentioned, Rory, for very different reasons. Mr. Harper entered office very skeptical about developing countries, which he then didn't know much about. Today, he's very knowledgeable about a number of uh, developing countries, including India. But when he was first prime minister, he wasn't. And he was fairly categorical in his contempt for Africa, for example, as seeing it as a continent that wasn't pulling its own weight and pulling up its socks, so to speak. And that coincided with a spat that the foreign minister, uh, John Beard, got himself into with an Arab country, the United Arab Emirates, right before the election. So in one fell swoop, Canada lost Africa and lost all the Arab countries, as far as I could make up. That was the election uh, about 15 years ago or, or 14 years ago. Um, the, the recent election, I think, was simply mismanaged by the government. Different government, different approach. I don't think the prime minister invested himself in it enough early enough. We entered the race after our two competitors. Our two competitors were very popular countries in the UN, Ireland and Norway. Norway is the most generous donor per capita in the world, unless it happens to be Sweden this week. Uh, but uh, Norway has been hugely generous. Canada has become a miser on uh, foreign aid. So frankly, look no further than uh, you know, politicians who tend to, uh, how can I say, believe their own propaganda that Canada is self-evidently fabulous, which the Canadian public loves hearing, but doesn't do much for us internationally. Uh, Canada, the rest of the world, particularly developing countries, see us uh, relocating, for example, many of their best educated citizens to Canada from uh, countries in desperate need of people who are highly educated. So Canada's self-image, I'm afraid, is not particularly shared in the developing world, and Canada needs to do a much better job in reconnecting. It's not enough to go to a Francophone summit or a Commonwealth summit and pose for photos. It requires hard work, personal engagement, and seriousness, of which there's been remarkably little, in my view, with the exception of one or two of the current cabinet's members. Thank you, David. And yes, I, I agree. It is a question of uh, wanting it enough to be able to make the changes inside your foreign policy as a whole uh, to reorient uh, around something like the UN and to meet the expectations of um, 193 members. Of course, being um, on the Security Council, uh, you go there and you're a non-permanent member, an elected member with no veto power. And um, a question came in, um, you know, what is your opinion about amending the permanent seat in the UN Security Council? So maybe you could touch on that for us. Well, I'd be all in favor of a reform of the membership of the council, particularly the veto carrying uh, uh, five permanent members. But the truth is each of those members can veto any change uh, in the way the charter sets out the parameters and limits of any reform to the Security Council. So I think it's simply not going to happen in the foreseeable future. 
what we'd like to see more of and that Bob Ray is working very hard on um, at the moment, as far as I can make out, uh, is to give the General Assembly much more voice in challenging the Security Council at times and doing what it can do if the Security Council is paralyzed. So um, that's a role that Canada played in the 1950s. You'll remember that Su the Suez cri uh, crisis response, the UN's first large-scale peacekeeping mission uh, that Lester Pearson and his team advocated, um, occurred as a result of a vote in the General Assembly, not in the Security Council. So the action will, if the Council is uh, deadlocked for any amount of time. The action will revert with the, to the General Assembly and Canada will have more opportunity to matter if Canada wants to matter. Well said, thank you. I, we did have a question here, Rougine, that was in the chat. And the question was, do Canadians generally support the notion of multilateral institutions and their roles in the world? And I thought, you know, because we, we really focused in on the WHO and foreign policy by Canadians, could you give us your impressions of the, of the representative public uh, view of one multilateral institution, which was uh, the WHO? Would you be willing to go into a bit more of the, uh, the general approach that people had towards that uh, institution? And also sure. what you see through all of your research, of course, you, you can go broader than that. Yeah, thank you. Sure, thanks, Rory. Um, so in terms of the, the view of Canadians of multilateral institutions, and in particular WHO, I think I touched on it a bit earlier, but um, uh, basically Canadians, I, I, my understanding and my perception is that Canadians view multilateral institutions as being important. Um, that they do fund, they do support funding them. Um, they do support uh, supporting in multi multilateral institutions, but also more generally, Canadians did understand the importance of multilateralism itself, right? Um, so, for instance, through increasing contributions to through um, overseas development aid, um, the they were in favor of in, in continuing to help developing countries in the po the post pandemic recovery. Um, and they also view the role of the WHO as being critical to all this, right? So the role of the WHO in both guiding the emergency response and also guiding the recovery. Where I think Canadians also exhibit a bit of hesitation is more so where bureaucratic layers are introduced or where they perceive an additional um, set. For instance, we posed a question around uh, a, a global health ambassador. Um, should that be something that Canada considers as useful? And that's where Canadians, I think, harbored some hesitations, right? What does the Global Health Ambassador do? What is the added contribution of that? Um, so, so yes, yes to supporting the multilateral institutions, but with strings attached and with understanding where their money is going. I think that was the bottom line. And wasn't there also a question about the WHO potentially intervening into countries with uh, less than full uh, consent? And um, the response from the Canadians was quite tepid towards that, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So in a way, Canadians had an understanding of the principle of sovereignty, uh, just like any other international lawyer would have. So they understood that it is extremely difficult to get a country to accept WHO's uh, in, in, you know, invitate or WHO's uh, decision to enter a country and investigate a potential outbreak without consent from that country. So right now there are multiple global health law reform initiatives underway. So we're discussing, for instance, a pandemic treaty and um, whether states consent to such a power for WHO is really up for debate, but it seems very unlikely, especially in this current political climate, that states are willing to retract from their sovereign, from their, from their, uh, you know, their stronghold on the principle of sovereignty to do so. And I think Canadians understood that and reflected that in their responses as well. Exactly, thank you. So I did wanna continue on. We, we did talk, talk about Ukraine already, uh, Rougine, and I wanted to open up by mentioning that uh, in case anyone hasn't heard, Lithuania, they canceled the decision to donate over 400,000 COVID-19 vaccine doses to Bangladesh after the country abstained from the General Assembly's vote on Russia. 
what do you make of that uh, decision? And uh, maybe you could use that as a, an opportunity to talk about um, our efforts. I'm going to ask you next about our efforts uh, in uh, vaccine distribution globally. Sure. So um, I the, I wrote a piece about this in Open in Open Canada. I think uh, a few days ago. Um, basically describing the, the, the fact that wars and pandemics are intertwined and the polarization that, I mean, much of the world supports uh, Ukraine in this crisis, but there is a, as, as uh, David has mentioned, there is a handful that have withheld from overt criticism of Russia. Um, and that has led to, that has potential impact on global health diplomacy as well, being the manifestation that you just mentioned around Lithuania canceling the donation of vaccine uh, vaccines to Bangladesh. And so right now, the world is in a situation where 85% of people living in the continent of Africa have yet to receive a single dose of, of vaccines. Um, and we're now also potentially facing polarization of the international community and these problematic uh, manifestations of global health diplomacy. So uh, the, the, where, the, where we go next, I mean, this was just one example, whether we'll see more of them the, is really out, uh, the verdict is out, but um, we certainly do need to, at, especially at this point in time, increase our contributions to COVAX, increase our donations, our bilateral donations to countries. Um, the, the COVID recovery, needs to be something that is viewed separately from the war and needs to be something that is that is still prioritized as uh, in and of itself um, as an important uh, pri as a global health priority. And what are the biggest risks from having a major conflagration like this uh, occurring in the midst of a pandemic and a, a very uh, virulent variant? Sorry, what did, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so with, um, with the Ukraine war very hot right now, what can we expect to see uh, as a result, uh, as a consequence uh, in the neighboring um, countries regarding the, the COVID-19? Regarding COVID uh, well, I think that generally wars and situations of war create, um, I think Bruce Aylward from WHO said this well, that, um, that uh, wars always create the conditions on which infectious diseases thrive. Um, so the potential, not only just the con, for instance, the, the um, people being grouped and huddled together in, um, you know, in bomb shelters or being huddled together in refugee camps or, or, or generally running away from the situation and being, being close together, that creates a condition that for, through which the virus can actually continue to transmit itself and content, potentially can lead to evolution of the virus and potentially a variant of concern. Um, as the case is also the same in, in the continent of Africa, where I mentioned again that 85% of people have yet to receive a single dose. So the, the war is, I think, adding on top of that another potential risk for variants of concern to emerge, um, and which, which basically means that this pandemic is far from over, uh, and in fact is po probably getting accelerated in terms of its, its next step or its next trajectory. May I add uh, to that, and Wu Jin's been absolutely terrific on the health issues she's been discussing, uh, that I think Lithuania's decision is a mistake taken at a passionate moment over an issue that is, you know, really very, very important to Lithuania, much more important than Canada. But why do I think it's a mistake? People in Bangladesh, that's 400,000 people who will not be either immunized or fully immunized against a potentially fatal disease. And it's misfiring, in my view. Bangladesh remains a poor country. It's done pretty well in its development track. But uh, I think punishing it for an abstention in the General Assembly on an issue it may feel it didn't have enough knowledge of to make a firm decision. I think it's a flat out mistake morally and otherwise. And, and uh, I would ask. Yeah, go ahead, Rajin. Okay. Well, um, I, I don't know if anyone on the call and uh, we have over a hundred uh, right now, but if we have any Lithuania experts, Lithuania domestic political experts on the call, I would 
certainly appreciate any insight uh, you have because it may be a question of good domestic politics uh, as well um, at a very um, uh, you know challenging time for for them but yeah I, I would have to agree that uh, this is a big mistake now here's a question that both of you may be able to answer from Stephen Hoffman what should the role of UN human rights treaties in guiding the world's responses to global health emergencies like COVID-19 be? I haven't heard many governments make reference to their international human rights obligations at any point during the pandemic. Uh, David, would you like to start? Sure, very good point. Uh, and so a very sharp question. And I agree with the thrust of the question. I think uh, basic human rights are being uh, challenged and in parts of the countries overridden uh, in the Ukraine, but human rights have disappeared from the picture uh, in the media. It's all about the violence. It isn't about basic rights. It's all about the military dimension. It isn't about what the people of Ukraine might want. Uh, and so I think it's occluded from view, and I think that's been a shortcoming of media coverage, but also perhaps government response, not just in Canada, but many governments' responses, uh, uh, non-prioritization of the human rights dimension of this crisis, which extends to the right to self-determination. Regine? Yeah, and I, I to to add to that and to look at it from the global health perspective. So um, throughout this pandemic, we've heard multi many statements, many resolutions being issued from countries, uh, from from forums like the G7, the G20, and in all of them, there's really a, a complete. Even during over the past two years of the uh, COVID pandemic, there's a complete, uh, as David said, uh, I, I think a. Uh, a subjecting of human rights to the peripheries. It's not discussing that as an international legal obligation. Um, and in particular, as we're looking to the pandemic treaty reforms, again, this is not a principle that's being uh, emphasized. What Canada has done, which is, which is brilliant, um, it, much better than other countries from what I've heard so far in pandemic treaty negotiations, is emphasize the principle of solidarity and equity, which are, of course, uh, sisters or, or or related concepts to human rights obligations, but are not obligations in and of themselves. And so we do need to bring out the right to health, which is a constitutional obligation under the World Health Organization's constitution. And, and that entails a whole series of other obligations, including obligations to help another country in times of emergencies, whether they be national security emergencies or global health emergencies, uh, obligations to share uh, uh, access to, to vaccines, and all that sort of thing. So it has all those implications. Um, and we're not, we're just not seeing that being discussed among countries at the moment. Yeah, thank you. I think that might lead into Clara's question, actually. So here's uh, Clara's question. In a more general setting, it is now commonly recognized that the multilateral system that emerged after World War II is outdated. Bretton Woods institutions, for example, are considered not to be representatives of representative of the current global reality, and countries such as China are up to building their own institutions. How do you envision a potential reform of the multilateral system? What role could the UN play in it, and what reforms would it need to do so? I will go to uh, David first, um, but uh, Regine, I think there's an answer in there directly onto the WHO, which, uh, which you might be able to uh, work in as well. Go ahead, David. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think, you know, the, the post-Second World War uh, multilateral system is aging. It's, you know, 75 or more years old now, 76. And the World Bank and IMF were created even before the UN in 1944, rather than 1945, uh, when the negotiation took place uh, uh, at Bretton Woods. So, um, it's an aging system. It doesn't, I think the questioner is quite right. It's a slightly sclerotic system. Uh, the uh, World Bank and the IMF had a wake up call uh, 
at the time of their, their uh, failed policies on uh, developing country indebtedness, trying to force structural adjustment on countries that simply could not adjust. Uh, they were too poor to adjust any further. Uh, and so they had a very humbling moment about 30 years ago, realizing they weren't emperors of the universe. And they've been quite a bit more humble since then. Uh, the UN has been aware for quite a long time, or those of us inside the UN system, that uh, uh, virtually all of its activities would benefit from different structures today. But the member states have trouble agreeing on uh, any reforms to the UN. There's no faster way to get a deadlock in the UN than to start suggesting specific reforms of the system. Uh, so in that sense, it's been widely felt more sensible in the UN context uh, to introduce incremental changes, sometimes changes by stealth. I'm not sure that's the right approach at all myself, but that's what's been uh, happening. I think the WHO also suffers from a degree of sclerosis and challenge from outside actors. For example, the WHO was weakened very much unintentionally by Bill Gates and his obsession with vertical funds to fight individual diseases, tuberculosis, malaria, and so on. Uh, and that actually money was withdrawn from the World Health Organization in part to fund those vertical funds that Gates was generous in funding, but he expected others to be generous too, including member states. So uh, I think Gates is much more aware today of the limitations of his strategy. Not all of it worked far from it. Uh, and it did weaken the WHO considerably. And that was a huge cost to pay. Is there a, is there a future for the UN you know, working more closely with our, our, our most giving uh, billionaires? Or should... Uh, should we be uh, cautious based on that example that you just gave us, David? Well, I think uh, that the, the billionaires are useful in reminding governments that they need to help. Uh, and that if they don't, others will take over. That's a useful message to governments. Uh, you may be about to lose one of your areas of competence or so-called competence. Um, but frankly, often they proceed on the basis of an obsession with a single issue, whereas the WHO has to knit together many, many health challenges at any given time. And even with the pandemic claiming all the headlines, WHO had to go on working, of course, on many other diseases, which over time claim many more lives than uh, COVID is likely to. <laughs> Regine, I would uh, love to hear your views on uh, reform of multilateral institutions, particularly the WHO, and I'll take the opportunity to quote from your recent article. You wrote that solidarity and trust are essential, not only to the social fabric of our communities, but also to global institutions that build our collective resilience against social health and security crises. And you, you did note that there's some reform going underway now. So what do we need as a global community to better prepare us for the next pandemic or to better respond to this one going forward? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Rory. So um, I guess just to take it a, a one level higher uh, at a higher level question uh, before I get into the specifics, um, I recently read a really interesting article, and this is because it relates directly to the question that I'm mentioning it. Um, around the fragmentation of global institutions and multilateral institutions and why that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it allows for more creativity, more, more, more innovation in the way that our multilateral institutions 
grow and further develop over time. So I think the incremental reforms that David mentioned is very likely the way that uh, institutions are changing, um, but also in the sense that the powers at play are changing, right? We're talking about receding of the United States, uh, gradual receding of the United States as, as the authority, which was not the case at the end of World War II. Um, and, and so increasing voices and having more voices at the table, shifting priorities at the international level, which is again, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think that with WHO, uh, uh, one way the institution is changing is through potential pandemic treaty reforms. Um, what that can do is for instance, increase access to medical countermeasures in times of emergency, which is something the WHO has been very reluctant to, to wade into uh, in, up to this present moment, up to the current crisis. Um, but also strengthening the WHO through financing reform. So the, the, the issues I mentioned at the very beginning, um, the, the governance structure of WHO itself is not, I think, bound to be changing anytime soon. It has the executive board, it has the World Health Assembly, it has a secretariat. And how these all interact with each other is by and large, I think by consensus, states are quite happy with that structure at the moment. It's more so the specific international laws that are at play that are that are shifting and changing. And I think one way to, so the international health regulations, which is what we currently have um, as the international law governing pen, public health emergencies, came into play after SARS. And so you really see with WHO this process of getting the courage to engage in international lawmaking efforts after some sort of crisis happens. And so crisis tends to bring countries together to think through problems that they hadn't thought through before and to develop solutions to them through international lawmaking. And in particular with an organization like the WHO, it's very reluctant to engage in normative powers unless it has such an impetus. And so now we have that impetus and that's where we're gonna see potential shifts in, in priorities around um, pu um, public health emergency response and preparedness. Okay, and Regine, what advice would you have to the Canadian government right now in the way that it's um, pushing for WHO reform? What would you be looking for from the Canadian government? Um, I would like, yeah, go, go on. Ahead, Jean, sorry. And then David. Please yeah. go ahead. Okay, well, I, I guess uh, I have a, just a quick wish list. Um, I would like our government to be the voice of uh, a, a pandemic treaty that is fair, that is equitable, that, that manages to integrate the voices of the global south and the needs of the global south in that treaty as well. We at the moment have um, uh, an international health regulations treaty which, which or right uh, agreement, international legal agreement, which is a good agreement. Um, but it doesn't include all those all those unique particularities to this pandemic that we now see as being necessary. For instance, again, access to medical countermeasures in times of emergency, um, uh, helping to build, creating an actual obligation, like a, a firm legal obligation of a pooled fund to build every country's health capacity to respond and detect to public health emergencies. These are what we're not seeing in the in IHR, the International Health Regulations, and what I hope to see the Canadian government championing moving forward. David? Uh, Blake, could you remind me of the core question, uh, Rory, sorry. Oh, no problem, yeah. So um, the question was, um, what uh, advice would you have to the Canadian government now vis-a-vis -vis its approach to uh, the World Health Organization and the pandemic? Um, but feel free to um, broaden that somewhat to our approach to the to the UN and multilateral institutions. Well, I think, uh, first of all, the Canadian public seems a lot less supportive of multilateral approaches. Uh, we've become a louder country. People's views are expressed more strongly. In a way, we're more American than we used to be. Uh, uh, and, and in a way, we saw that with the uh, alleged freedom lovers taking over Ottawa for three weeks, feeling they had a basic human right to inconvenience hundreds of thousands of people, as well as paralyzing the government, as they hoped. That is not something that happens every day in Canada historically. So um, I think it's not just an issue for government. I think it's an issue for Canadians too. How much are we willing to invest in international relations? Uh, 
Do we see the world, the, the rest of the world primarily as a pool uh, for uh, uh, us to pick out desirable immigrants? Or do we actually think the rest of the world is important to us in every sphere, not just trade or immigration or uh, as a you know recipient of the much diminished Canadian aid program, but uh, how interested are we in the rest of the world? So I think that is, and how much do we prioritize the rest of the world? So I think that's as much a challenge for Canadians as it is for the government, and perhaps the government losing its bearings a bit in the last Security Council election is simply a reflection that the whole issue didn't matter much in Canada. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, having been involved in the first loss, it was a 24-hour uh, story, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I, uh, through my rose-colored glasses, I expected it to be more of a story than it was, uh, absolutely. Um, I think we may overestimate or, or underestimate the disconnect between our foreign policy um, and where Canadians stand, which I think is something that the foreign policy by Canadians uh, exercise was looking to, to bridge. Um, now, uh, David, a couple of questions that come in about uh, the UN, again, and the Security Council, and I guess if I could put them together, it would be, do you expect much, if anything, to change at the UN, including the Security Council, as a result of the concurrent crises right now of COVID-19 and the Ukraine war? Should we expect that events will change the UN, or is it the other way around? <laughs> yes, events do change the UN. The, at the end of the Cold War empowered the UN greatly. The three-cornered hostility of China, Russia, and the United States is weakening the UN. So the outside world impinges hugely on the UN and its capacity to operate well. It goes on operating one way or another, but whether it's operating well uh, or, or, or perhaps in a perfect world optimally, uh, is something very much dependent on uh, the citizenry of the world, on the governments of the world. And I think that commitment to uh, international uh, management of crisis situations, be they health or uh, security, has unfortunately been eroding for perhaps the last 20 years or so. I often place it around uh, the uh, very negative reaction of President Bush, the second President Bush, to being denied a mandate in the Security Council to attack Kuwait. The Security Council was right and President Bush was wrong. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the UN has paid a price for that. Which, I, if I recall correctly, David, that was Colin Powell who had uh, pushed for to, to take a shot at the Security Council prior to. It was really the British who wanted to take a, a shot at it. And Colin Powell was the American emissary who went. And he did as good a job as he could of saying, you know, of, of advancing the arguments, but the arguments for the use of force against the Iraqi regime were very weak. And the occupation that uh, followed, the American occupation that followed, the Brits weren't able to contribute much to it, uh, was a disaster for the US, as is widely recognized in the US and elsewhere now. So uh, the nice thing is that in retirement, President Bush has been quite humble about all of this, far than being belligerent and trying to burnish his credentials. He spent his time visiting war veterans and uh, uh, learning how to paint. Pretty useful on balance compared to what he was like as a president. <laughs> um, don't quote us. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think regret is a powerful force uh, though. Um, just one more question for you, David, and then we'll have just a quick any concluding remarks from both of you. This um, this effort by um, permanent representative Bob Ray at the UN to move uh, 
to bring more authority to the to the General Assembly uh, actions. Do you think that the charter will really allow that to happen, or I mean, charter already it, allows it. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't require the charter. What it requires is a change in habits at the UN. Uh, instead of constantly deferring to the Security Council, the General Assembly might occasionally telegraph to the Council, if you don't do something decisive, we will. Mm. Mm. And that will attract the attention of the Council. But actually, the General Assembly has become much too deferential. The International Court of Justice helped build substance into the capacity of the General Assembly to act on peace and security uh, issues in the 1950s and 1960s, notably over the Middle East, as I mentioned, and the Congo. And uh, the General Assembly seemed to have forgotten that. It, it had allowed itself to be mesmerized by the council. Big mistake. All right, thank you. That might be a subject for another uh, another meeting for sure. Thank you, David. Now, um, we're just about out of time here, but Regine, in the last maybe 60 seconds or so, did you want to have any uh, conclusions, anything you want to add uh, advice uh, for policy policymakers or for those who are uh, listening at this point and what they might be able to do uh, to support multilateral institutions like the WHO? Sure. Thanks, Rory. So I, I think what, you know, the, the key theme in all this is really the understanding of the interactions between multilateral institutions and governments and the people of governments, what they choose, what they want their governments to prioritize as foreign policy issues. Um, we're not living in, an, in, in, single, in a single issue world. We're not living in a world where there's only one uh, one crisis and not another. And what I wrote uh, in Open Canada was that crises, and in particular pandemics, don't necessarily have a timing of when they're going to strike us. They'll strike us whether the world is polarized, they'll strike us whether the world is uh, acting together in solidarity. They do not care. The viruses do not care. They will hit us whenever they want. And um, the, the, the reality of all that is that we need to create solid laws and institutions um, that will withstand potential other crises that may happen at the same time. And so for instance, an international security crisis and um, really how we craft that is what our, what our listeners and what all of us now need to pay attention to. Um, in particular, I really hope everyone leaving this call um, gains more interest in pandemic treaty discussions because that's something and, and, and IHR reform discussions because that's stuff that will impact us for the next pandemic down the line. So I hope that we do maintain that interest moving forward. And I appreciate the CIC for giving this platform and lovely to chat with David. Thank you. Thank you, Regine. Over to you, David, for any final words. Well, uh, I agree with uh, Regine uh, very much. Um, I think, you know, it's harder for all of us to keep all ourselves informed of what's going on in the world nowadays. The internet is everything and nothing because there's so much of it that we can't uh, get a, a grip on it, so to speak. And newspapers are collapsing in Canada and elsewhere. They used to keep us informed. TV news varies. People seem to be more interested in local issues rather than international issues. And that's a luxury, being much more interested in garbage collection than in global security. So I think we need to get a grip and re-engage with the world, not so much the government doing that. Ministers travel nonstop in normal circumstances to meet other ministers globally. It's much more a challenge to citizens remain engaged with the world. And I don't think we're doing a very good job of that in Canada. I think we wallow in self-satisfaction and how fabulous Canada is. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, to both Regine and David for your excellent interventions uh, today. It was really great. Uh, we're out of time. I do have one request for our attendees, uh, which is click on the link cic.org become a member. I mean, first of all, you should be a member already, and I don't know why you aren't. But if for some reason you aren't and you still found your way here, please click the link, leave it open, check it out later, 
just have a look at it because we are looking for new members. And if you like this event, we have these going on every week across the country and you can access many of these events uh, from Victoria all the way to the East Coast. So uh, thank you both, thanks to both of you once again. Thank you, Caroline, uh, for helping organize from CIC Hamilton and have a great uh, rest of the day. Thank you, thank you very uh, much. Thank you to Regine and thank you to David and thanks to our thank audience. Thank you so much. And Regine, it was wonderful meeting you. You too. Thank you so much, David. Bye. Bye and Rory, thanks so much for moderating us very well. It was fun and great to reconnect with you, David. Absolutely. Bye. Bye.